Humans are not from Earth by Dr. Alice Silver Introduction You've probably heard of the book Men are from Mars and Women are from Venus. What you may not have considered is the wider implication of that title, that neither man nor woman are from Earth. The evidence against human beings originating on planet Earth is overwhelming, though you've undoubtedly suspected it yourself on more than one occasion. Where are humans actually from? At the end of this short book, I'll list the seven most likely candidate stars that are home planet orbits and describe the physical and environmental conditions that most probably exist there, so we'll be able to recognize it when we eventually find it. A footnote. Man and woman aren't from Mars, or Venus either, but we'll get to that later. How did we get here? If we didn't originate on Earth, then how the heck did we get here? The simple truth must be that we were brought here by somebody else. We'll have to call them aliens, for want of a better term, but I don't want to put you off. This isn't one of those crazy books about weird-looking aliens. This is a book about humans. And there's a reasonable chance that the aliens look almost exactly like us. Note. If you can think of a better term than aliens, I would be pleased to hear from you. Some of the terms that have been suggested include space travelers or space dwellers, fellow galaxians or extrasolar hominids, or how about Milky Whalians, as suggested by my friend David Haslett. Why would these aliens decide to bring us here? Perhaps they thought the Earth lacked a dominant species and felt the need to give it one. Perhaps we were brought here as a natural predator to reduce the number of another species that was getting out of control, much as we might introduce ladybugs to a new environment in order to control aphids. We've driven plenty of species to extinction since we arrived, so it's very likely that this worked. However, I very much doubt that the aliens ever envisaged we would take over the planet to the degree that we have. Perhaps they'll be back one day soon, bringing with them another species to call our numbers down to our most sustainable level. They might simply bring a virus, of course. In fact, they might have attempted this course of action several times throughout our recorded history, hence the numerous plagues and viruses such as AIDS and SARS, which apparently sprang out of nowhere. Note. At the end of this book, I've given details of some alternative hypotheses about how we got here. I'm concentrating on the brought here by aliens hypothesis in this book, since that's the one I believe in most strongly. But there are good cases for some of the others too, particularly the gene splicing one, which combines the DNA of early man with some of the aliens' own DNA to create hybrid spaces, modern man. If the aliens are out there, why can't we detect them? Much is made of the fact that our radio and television broadcasts have been radiating from Earth for almost a century. But if this is the case, why aren't these signals also radiating from other highly developed planets? If they were, then we would easily be able to detect them. The answer, of course, is that such transmission exists for only a brief period in planet's history. Here on Earth, they are unlikely to exist for more than another decade or two. We are rapidly reaching the point where all such broadcasts will be cable, internet or low-power wireless signals that extend no more than a mile or so from the nearest radio mast. So as far as radio emissions are concerned, the Earth will appear to go dark within the next generation, while life on the planet continues. If scientific progress runs at the same rate on other planets, and if they've developed a few decades ahead of us, they won't be emitting any radio signals at all by now. Their radio era will have ended and it will be impossible for us to detect them by listening out for the radio signals. They might have stuck with cables and low power wireless and skipped the high power broadcast completely. Or perhaps they used some other forms of communication, like infrared, light, laser, fiber optics, microwaves or something else that we don't even know about. Our only real hope of spotting them is if they're broadcasting radio signals into space deliberately because they want to be found by highly developed species on other planets. Since we haven't spotted any so far, it seems that none of the species on nearby planets is currently doing this. 
If they're there, they don't want us to know about it. We know with near certainty that they are out there somewhere, because if they weren't, then we wouldn't be living here on Earth in an environment that clearly isn't our natural one. 17 factors which suggest we are not from Earth. The first one. The sun hurts our eyes. This is the interesting factor that led to this book being written. I was walking along the street, turned a corner, and was hit full face by the sun. Total whiteout. I couldn't see a thing. I had to shield my eyes with my hands and hurry to the next corner while blindly stumbling along, hoping I wouldn't hit anything. When I reached the shade and my vision returned, I looked up in the sky and saw the birds flying around perfectly happily in all directions. They weren't crashing into buildings and trees, yelling, holy shit, my eyes, I can't see a fucking thing. Then I remembered the time when I was driving along a country road one night and I came up on a rabbit. Or it may have been a smaller deer, it was a long time ago. It stood there in the middle of the road in the full glare of my headlights and it didn't even blink. If that had been me in the road, I'd gone from total darkness to full beam headlights shining directly into my eyes. I'd have yelled, holy shit, my eyes, I can't see a fucking thing. And I scampered away in the forest, crying for my mother probably. But our little rabbit, our dear friend, wasn't bothered in the slightest. After a few seconds, pretending to be a statue, it turned away quite casually and hopped off into the field perfectly happy. Blinded by the light, it was not. These creatures are native to Earth and have had millions of years to adapt to living here, so it's not surprising that they can cope so well. What is surprising is that we humans, supposedly the most advanced species on the planet, can't cope. What the heck has gone wrong? According to the theory of evolution, we evolved from creatures like that. Millions and millions of years ago. Chances are they were able to cope with living here way back then too. Which means that we should be able to cope at least as well as they can, if not better. After all these extra millions of years of development and improvement by Mother Nature? But we can't. Which means that Either something has gone terribly wrong with evolution, and this is the most likely explanation, as far as I can make out, we are not from here. Being dazzled by the sun is only the beginning though. When you start thinking about it, it doesn't take very long to come up with an extensive list of highly compelling examples, some of which I've examined below. Note. The rabbit's amazing ability to cope with electric lights or anything else is probably down to its famously rapid breeding cycle and ability to reproduce at young age. A human being can only pass his adapted genetics on once he reaches maturity, which normally takes a couple of decades. A rabbit can pass its adapted genetics on within three or four months of birth. Since we have developed electric street lights, for example, there have only been five human generations but more than 500 rabbit generations. Little wonder then that they are better adapted to modern living than we are. Second, the sun kills us. The sun doesn't just blind us and send us crashing into trees, buildings, lampposts and other people if we accidentally look at it. It also doing its best to kill us. We don't have body hair, so we have to cover ourselves in factor 50 sunscreen to avoid getting skin cancer. Most of us only bother with the gloopy stuff if we're going to the beach, when in fact we should be slathering ourselves in it almost every day. But why do we even need to? Surely we can't have developed to depend on it, or do we? Lizards, which supposedly evolved from even longer ago than birds and rabbits, can sunbathe for as long as they like, and many of them do. But if we did, <laughs> as for as long as they do, we'd almost certainly die. We can just about get away with it for a week or two each year on the beach, if we use enough sunscreen. But day after day in the sun? Forget it. You might just as well lie on the freeway and wait for a bus to hit you. At least your death will be more pleasant. It's not just skin cancer though. Sunlight dries and shrivels up our skin and makes us look old before our time. 
It also gives off ultraviolet radiation, which ruins our eyes by giving us cataracts. Other animals, which are native to Earth and have therefore adapted to living here, don't get cataracts from being out in the sun all day. Think of cattle, sheep, pigs, horses or kangaroos. Their skin doesn't shrivel up. Most of them don't get skin cancer either, although a few have been known to get it on the tips of their ears, where they aren't protected by fur. If fur or scales, in the case of lizards, are essential to avoiding skin cancer, and it seems that they are, then why the heck don't we have any? Why do we have to wear wide-brimmed hats and sunscreen and sunglasses? Or stay out of the sun completely? If this is our natural environment? The simple answer is that the Earth isn't our natural environment. Living underground or underwater are other ways to avoid the sun's danger. But we don't do either of those things. Something is clearly wrong here. Third, SAD, Seasonal Affective Disorder. The opposite of having too much sun is having too little of it, and here on Earth that's a problem too. Those long winter months with low light levels leave us feeling depressed and lethargic. Other symptoms of SAD can include sickness, overeating and weight gain, excess sleeping, lack of energy, difficulty concentrating, social withdrawal, loss of sex drive and even suicide. We clearly aren't meant to be here. Our home planet must have a more consistent level of light, probably more akin to summertime on Earth. And that consistent level of good quality light probably extends to the whole planet, rather than just a small region of it. That means no seasonal variations, or in other words, our home planet doesn't have a tilt, as the Earth does. Earth's native flora and fauna has adapted to the seasonal variations. For example, Many species of birds migrate thousands of miles each year to areas that suit them better. And they do migrate back again six months later, when the conditions have reversed. Creatures which lack the ability to fly have adapted in other ways. Some go into hibernation. Others prepare for winter by reducing their activity and suspending their reproduction to match the scarcity of food. Human beings don't do any of these things. We haven't evolved the necessary mechanisms, quite simple because on our home planet there was no need to evolve them. Some people argue that the seasonal affective disorder, SAD, SAD, is the equivalent evolutionary response to hibernation in other animals. This sounds reasonable enough until you realize that we aren't any good at it. It makes us ill. After millions of years of evolution and as the supposedly most advanced species on the planet, the fact that we have failed to adapt to the seasonal variations that have been around since the Earth first formed, or at least since the Moon first formed, just doesn't make any sense. Once again, it's clear that we must come from somewhere where the light levels are more consistent throughout the year. East Africa, where we supposedly evolved, is one of such places on the Earth. But perhaps that's because the aliens choose it for that specific purpose because the light levels are more consistent with those on our home planet. However, our natural inclination is to spread out and colonize our planet, which we have done on Earth. The fact that we were unable to do so without coming to the degree of harm, including SAD and its many symptoms, has serious repercussions. It's one of the strongest indicators that we are not of this world. The fourth. Bad backs. The gravity here on Earth is not what we're used to. As I'll explain below, Earth's gravity is probably a little lower than our home planet. As a consequence, we're growing taller with each generation, and back problems are becoming an increasing problem, with over 100 million working days per year lost in the US alone. Yet back problems are not an issue for any of Earth's native animals, not even the giraffes. And there has been no noticeable increase in back problems in any of those species. There is another factor we must briefly consider, and that is the atmosphere, which presses down upon us. Since we can breathe perfectly well, it's reasonable to assume that the Earth's atmosphere and that of our home planet are broadly the same, not only in composition, but also in pressure. I will therefore rule the atmosphere out for now as the cause of the problems of excessive tallness. 
However, there might well be some component of it that is causing or contributing to the problem. So I might re-examine it in a future edition, if evidence emerges to support it. There are two main schools of thought as to why we are growing excessively tall and suffering from more and more back problems. The first is that the food on Earth is more nutritious and more plentiful than our home planet, leading to unacceptable levels of growth that we are not able to cope with. This also explains the growing obesity problems and other factors such as excessively large babies, which we will look at next. It is also undoubtedly a major contributory factor to the growing problems of human overpopulation on Earth. One interesting indicator that high rates of nutrition might be the primary factor in causing back problems in humans can be seen in parasitic worms, such as roundworms and tapeworms which inhabit the gut of most of Earth's creatures. In native species, the worms remain small, harmless and undetected. But when they get into the human gut, they find themselves in such a nutritious environment that they grow and grow many times larger than in all other creatures, sometimes filling the entire gut and causing serious health issues for their unfortunate hosts. Problems can include malnutrition, mental retardation, intestinal blockages and even death. And if the human host dies, the worm dies. A consequence that was surely never intended. There is of course the argument that we ourselves have made our food more readily available and more nutritious. And this is undoubtedly a major contributing factor too. But since this problem of oversized parasitic worms is common in parts of Africa and Asia where food is scarce and nutrition rates are lower compared with the rest of the world, it can't be the only factor. The plain truth is that when a parasitic worm finds itself inside a human host, well nourished or not, it grows like topsy. And it doesn't do that in any other animal. It's clearly in an alien environment, just like we are. The other main school of thought, and the one I most support, comes back to gravity. If the gravity on Earth is slightly lower than what we are evolved to cope with, that could lead us to growing taller and taller over successive generations. Unfortunately, we are growing at such a rate that our skeletons and musculature don't have time to adapt. If, on the other hand, Earth's gravity is higher than what we're used to, it could be argued that we're growing taller in order to combat the downward pressure. This seems pretty unlikely to me, so I'm going to plump for our native planet's gravity being stronger than Earth's. This fits in with other factors, which I'll discuss later, such as a day on our home planet lasting 25 hours, compared with the Earth's 24 hours. This means that our home planet is probably a little larger than Earth, and the gravity consequentially is ever so slightly higher. Human babies are growing way too big inside of the poor mothers, who have a devil of a job getting them out. Some of them, both mothers and babies, die in the process or suffer severely leading to things like cerebral palsy, which is caused by oxygen deprivation or birth trauma. No other truly native species on earth has this problem. We must exclude certain types of animals that we have manipulated through selective crossbreeding. Once again, there are two separate schools of thought as to the reason. The first is that our babies grow so large because of better nutrition on Earth, much better than on our own native planet. The second is that our heads have become much larger in proportion to the rest of our bodies in order to accommodate our superior brains. This might be a good time to introduce a second hypothesis about our origins on Earth. The human-alien hybridization. It's a well-known fact that humans share a significant portion of their DNA with other plants and animal species found on Earth, and probably throughout the universe. On Earth, the same genes can be traced from the most primitive species right through the most advanced ones. We share 55% of our DNA with bananas, 60% with the fruit fly, and it's commonly reported that we share 98% with the chimpanzee. However, these figures can be misleading because it depends on exactly what you're comparing. It's the actual genes that are the most important. In fact, the latest research, which takes into account insertions and deletions in the genetic sequence, 
revise the amount of DNA we share with chimps down from 98.5% to 95% and 91% in the case of pigs. And there's another key difference that is rarely mentioned. Chimps have 24 pairs of chromosomes, whereas we only have 23. If humans are born with a 24th chromosome, it causes Down syndrome. Organ transplants between chimps and humans and also between pigs and humans fail because of one vital misplaced gene. It doesn't matter how close our genetic code is. If one of the genes isn't there, then it just won't work. Scientists working on the Human Genome Project and other DNA projects have discovered an extra 223 genes in humans that do not appear in any other species on Earth. Where the heck did they come from? Some geneticists believe that they were spliced into the DNA of native Earth hominids, Homo erectus, directly from the aliens themselves. Although whether the aliens spliced in sections of their own DNA or took it from another alien species is unknown. This resulted in the instant leap from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens, the modern human, with no missing link between. I'll come back to the lack of the missing link again in the next section. This would explain our close genetic link with other native Earth species. It also goes a considerable way to explaining the many problems we have with life on this planet. We could assume, for example, that the aliens have large heads and large brains, which we inherited from them in the additional 223 genes. But they probably also have large bodies, most notable a wide pelvic base, which we did not inherit. This means that while the aliens would have no problems giving birth to their large-headed children, modern humans have enormous problems, as our pelvic bases are much too narrow. Thanks a lot, aliens. Many of the other factors covered in this chapter, intolerance to sunlight and so on, can also be explained by this hybridization process. We know that early men had heavy brows to shield their eyes. When the extra 223 genes were added, our skulls changed shape, our craniums grew larger and our heavy brows disappeared. Clearly the aliens don't have any pronounced brows, because on their world they don't need them. Unfortunately, on Earth, we do need them, and without them we have major problems. So if this theory is true, we are mostly native to Earth, yet some important parts of us are most definitely not. Number 6. Fossil records and the lack of a missing link. According to Darwin's theory of evolution, we ascended from the same evolutionary branch as the apes. Yet fossil records show the link between early apes and modern humans has been never found. In the earliest 20th century, the need to find the missing link became so desperate that an elaborate hoax was created. The Piltdown Man, discovered in 1912, was believed to be genuine for over 40 years. But in fact, it was faked using a medieval human skull, the jawbone of an orangutan and the fossilized teeth from a chimpanzee and then aged by soaking it in acid and staining it with an iron solution. The simple truth is that the missing link just isn't there. There is more hard evidence for the existing of aliens, UFOs and ghosts than there is for the missing link between apes and modern humans. And a significant proportion of the population denies that those things even exist. The only proven connection we have with apes is that we share a significant portion of our DNA with them. But for all we know, we might share just as much of our DNA with a million of other species elsewhere in the universe. As I mentioned above, one reason why the link might not be there is because aliens might have inserted a series of carefully chosen genes into early men or replaced specific sections of their DNA, thereby causing an instant evolutionary leap to modern men. So there is no missing link. Another reason might be because we're brought here from our native planet by the aliens, as fully evolved modern humans. The close DNA link with our supposed earthly ancestors might be purely coincidental if the DNA is common throughout the universe. Again, there would be no missing link. Earth's native hominids die out or more likely were driven to extinction as we took over. Humans are the only species that has failed to adapt to the environment here on Earth. The only way we can survive is by using our superior brain power. 
But surviving isn't the same thing as living. We can't really be said to be enjoying the experience. It's easy to list hundreds of examples of how poorly adapted to the environment we are compared with other native species. For a start, we don't like the food that grows naturally here. We have had to modify it to our taste. Cultivate species and wild species bear little resemblance to each other in size, color, taste or texture. And even then we usually cook it because we don't like it the way nature intended it. The food on our home planet must have been so much nicer, though perhaps less plentiful and less nutritious. Many native mammals are able to sense the Earth's natural phenomena, earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes and so on. If we are descended from the ancestors of those creatures, then we really ought to be able to sense these things too. After all, the phenomena existed long before any of the Earth's native creatures evolved. Yet we have no awareness whatsoever of the oncoming danger. The first we know about is when it hits us. But where are all the other animals? The dogs, the cattle, bird, even toads? They knew it. They knew it was coming and they fled to safety, often several days before the phenomena occurred. If we really evolved on this planet, then there is something very wrong and incredibly bizarre going on here. It also seems quite likely that our home planet doesn't have earthquakes, tsunamis or hurricanes. And then there's our sense of direction, or lack of it. Salmon can find their way back to their spawning grounds from hundreds and hundreds of miles away. Homing pigeons can find their way back to their roosts from wherever you set them free, even if you take them to another country before releasing them, and even if they were kept in total darkness throughout the whole journey. Migratory birds fly thousands and thousands of miles, yet they return to exactly the same nests six months later. Cats and dogs can find their way back to their old houses, even if their owners move to a new address, hundreds of miles away. Some of them even catch buses and trains, and they know which ones to catch and where to get on and get off. You, on the other hand, are probably always getting lost or forgetting which way to go. I've gotten completely lost in an office building I used to work in, and I once failed to find my way home from an address just a few streets away. We're so bad at it, we had to invent maps and GPS to help us find our way around. And even then we drive into rivers. Most of Earth's native species find their way around by using the planet's magnetic field. Researchers have discovered that we also have cells within our brains which can detect magnetic fields. Unfortunately, the Earth's magnetic field appears to be too weak for us to use. Our home planet probably has a much stronger magnetic field. On the plus side, there's also evidence that suggests that one of the main reasons why we developed language and the ability to speak was so that we could give each other directions, mainly to find food and to cooperate on hunting trips. It's highly likely that we had already developed language on our home planet long before we were brought to Earth. Even if we had been shipped to Earth as embryos, the ability to develop language would have been encoded in our genetic memory. This could explain why we developed it on Earth so quickly. Number 8. Lack of body hair. This is another example of being poorly adapted to our environment. Even in East Africa, where we all allegedly have evolved from, it gets pretty cold at night. We have to wrap ourselves up to stave off hypothermia and death. Fortunately, we are intelligent enough to know that we need to do this. But the big question is. Why did we lose most of our body hair in the first place? Assuming we are from Earth and our ancestors had hair, what happened in the intervening stages? Presumably we must have started wearing clothes, animal skin and the need for hair disappeared. We still have body hair of course. It's just that most of it is so short that it serves little or no practical purpose. So we're basically naked. The world's finest scientists have struggled with this question for hundreds of years without coming up with any convincing answer. Only in the last three years a possible answer has come up. The advantages. Fewer body lice and other external parasites. Lower likelihood of catching fire. Easier to lose body heat by sweating. 
We can regulate our temperature by adding or removing layers or using different materials, allowing us to colonize parts of the planet that would otherwise be inhospitable. Refuting these arguments First, other primates cope perfectly well with lice by mutual grooming. Second, many scientists believe we lost our body hair long before we learned how to control fire. Third, other primates also sweat despite of having hair. And their hair actually makes sweating more efficient. It acts as thousands of wicks which carry moisture away from their skin, so it evaporates and helps cool them down more quickly. We also have hair around our genitals. In males the testicles need to be kept cooler than the rest of the body and public hair helps this by wicking away the moisture and boosting the rate of evaporation. The hair on our heads also been proven to help rather than hinder cooling. Other mammals, such as big cats, produce significantly more body heat than we do when hunting their prey. If lack of hair enabled them to cool down more quickly or stay in the hunt for longer, then they would have lost their hair too, but they haven't. Other possibilities We were brought here from another planet, where there was no need for us to have body hair. Perhaps the daytime and nighttime temperature were more evenly balanced. Reasons for this might include thick cloud cover preventing heat loss, the ground absorbing heat during the day and radiating it at night, binary or twin suns, so it never grows cold or dark, or a thin planetary crust allowing heat from the molten core to heat the land. I'll examine some of these in more detail later. Another interesting possibility has been suggested which could have happened either on Earth or on our home planet. The aliens spliced our DNA together with that of a highly evolved sea mammal, which would have been hairless. This would also go some way to explain our thick layer of subcutaneous fat, which is not seen in any other land mammal, but it is found in several species that inhabit the sea. Others suggest that the DNA splicing might not have happened at all, but the land mammals we evolved from returned to the sea around 10 million years ago before coming back out later, now practically hairless and with the extra fatty layer for insulation, and then we evolved from them. Evidence to support this Bipedalism, which forces us to walk upright on land. This is terrible for our backs, but makes us good swimmers. Vestigial webbing between fingers and toes. We have this in our family. The increased subcutaneous fat and loss of hair as already mentioned. A kidney structure similar to that found in marine mammals, where it is highly efficient at removing salt from their blood, but not seen in any other land mammals, including the apes we are supposedly descend from. The diving reflex, which slows our heart rate when our head is underwater, together with our ability to voluntarily control our breathing. Vernix, the waxy coat that covers babies when they are born. Again, this is not found in any other land mammal, but it is seen in several sea mammals. Evidence to refute this Our skin has a completely different structure from that of marine mammals. It gets waterlogged and disintegrates when exposed to water for a prolonged period. You can see the beginning of this for yourself if you examine your fingertips after a few minutes of a bath. All current hairless marine mammals evolved tens of millions of years ago, not 10 million years ago. Our kidneys do not remove salt very efficiently, hence the constant appeals from doctors to reduce our salt intake. Our bodies cannot get rid of it easily through our kidneys. In fact, sweating is a far more efficient way of removing it. There is not enough evidence to say whether other land mammals do or do not have voluntarily breath control. This doesn't explain why we have hair on our heads and pubic regions and to a limited extent all over our bodies. It also doesn't explain why apes have hair and we do not. Early hominids are thought to have split from the ape branch of evolution between 5 and 7 million years ago so they should exhibit these same characteristics, but they don't. Most scientists now dispute that this temporary return to the sea ever happened. Other possibilities 
Another school of thought suggests that we lost our hair during one of the ice ages, because food on land was scarce and we were forced to hunt in the water. Those with less hair dried off and therefore warmed up faster than those with more hair, who were more likely to die of hypothermia. Another theory suggests that we don't have hair for the same reasons that land mammals such as elephants and hippos don't. They can cool themselves down by spraying or submerging themselves into water or wallowing in cool mud. Though, when did you last wallow in mud? Why do we need to wear thicker clothes or extra layers to colonize other parts of the planet? Why don't we simply grow thicker body hair just like every other land mammal has done? The arguments for and against each of these hypotheses continues to rage on in the scientific community, and there are plenty more of them. Clearly there are no clear answers, at least here on Earth. It probably makes a lot more sense on our home planet. Number 9. Hay fever and asthma. Here are more reasons why the Earth's environment doesn't suit us. You'd think that after all these millions of years of evolution we'd have adapted to it by now wouldn't you? Well, we probably would have, if we had been here for millions of years. But the likelihood is that we only showed up a few tens of thousands of years ago when the aliens kindly dropped us off. Apparently that isn't long enough to adapt to all the pollen and other stuff floating around in the air of this world. Not to mention the allergy triggering feces excreted by the dust mites. Sure, we probably have something like the dust mites back on our home planet too, but they are different. And we were used to them, just as we were used to the pollen there. That's definitely not the case on Earth. The weird stuff in the air here is all new to us, at least in evolutionary terms. But here we hit the problem. If things continue as they are, then we are never going to evolve to tolerate this stuff. We have medicine which treat to some extent the symptoms. A few people die from asthma attacks, but not that many anymore. And did you ever hear of anyone dying from hay fever? Not unless they already had some other kind of underlying life-threatening lung condition. People with hay fever or asthma aren't any less attractive than anyone else, most of the time. So they aren't any less likely to breed. By treating their symptoms, they are able to continue living, breeding and passing on their intolerance to the next generation. Evolution isn't going to solve this problem unless we give evolution a helping hand. Gene therapy might provide a solution eventually. Then we just have to hope that the solution gets passed on to our children. There are of course plenty of people who complain that gene therapy is playing God. But isn't that exactly what the aliens did when they brought us here? The only way we can make life completely tolerable here is to play God to ourselves. And we still have a long, long, long way to go. Number 10. Diet. As I mentioned earlier, although the food on earth is edible and highly or even overly nutritious, it's also pretty horrible compared with what we're used to on our home planet. Aside from a few notable exceptions, we don't like the taste, color or texture of a great deal of what's available here. So we've carried out selective breeding programs to turn it into something we're happier with. For example, Earth's naturally occurring wild carrots are small and purple and taste of wood. So we made them big and orange and tasty carroty. The big problem is that the food we really like on Earth is also really bad for our health. Surely we can't have evolved that way. Logic says we should have evolved to love the things that are best for us and shun the things that are not. Yet, the opposite seems to be the true. Why? Well, once again, the simplest explanation is that we aren't from here. The foods that are best for us on Earth Raw fruits, vegetables, nuts, berries, fish, white meat. The foods we eat least on earth. Raw fruits, vegetables, nuts, berries, fish, white meat. The foods that are bad for us on earth. Chocolate, sugar, salt, red meat, saturated fat, alcoholic drinks. 
the foods we like most on earth. Chocolate, sugar, salt, red meat, saturated fats, alcoholic drinks. That pretty much says it all. That needs to be said. Either evolution has screwed up big time or we can't possibly be from this planet. Significant number of people also have potentially lethal intolerances to many of the foods that are found here. Wheat, gluten, cow's milk, lactose intolerance, eggs, yeast, nuts and more. So after millions of years of evolution, some of us still can't handle the food that is available here? That just doesn't make any kind of sense. We clearly haven't been here all that long and we're clearly used to be somewhere else. Number 11. Excessive reproduction, overpopulation. Why does a species become overpopulated? Quite simply, it's all down to an abundance or overabundance of food and a lack of predators. Here on Earth both of these conditions are met and our population is still spiraling out of control. Scientists say we have long since passed the point where the Earth has enough resources to meet everyone's needs. Science keeps producing crops that produce higher yields, have better resistance to disease, are better able to grow in poor soil conditions, and so on. But even so, there's a limit to how fast it can keep up as the population continues to expand. But it's not just about food, of course. We also need water, shelter, fuel and all sorts of other things that there's a finite supply of. Where are those resources coming from? There's only one answer to that. We're depleting the resources that future generations will need. Humans are ingenious and highly adaptable, though. As one resource dries up, another will most likely be discovered or invented and people will come up with new ideas. But our population can't continue growing forever. Our sperm counts are falling. Some say this is our own fault. We've polluted our water supplies with estrogen from the urine of women who take birth control pills. Others think it might be aliens doing it, or God, or even the Earth itself, trying to thin out our numbers before we totally destroy the place. Science is trying to counter this by developing things like in vitro fertilization, or test tube babies, but it's an expensive process and success rates are pretty low. Governments are now waking up to the problem and starting to legislate against overpopulation. Though only China has so far been bold enough to introduce a one-child-per-couple law. As things stand, we're still growing at an out-of-control rate. The aliens, or God, or the Earth, or something else, clearly aren't happy about the situation. Over the next few decades, I believe we can expect to see more frequent, bigger and more audacious attempts to call our numbers down. The process might well have started already. RPs are disappearing at an alarming rate and there have been some seriously close and potentially deadly encounters with asteroids recently. Some of which we didn't see coming until they were already upon us. Either one of those could call our numbers far more effectively than any war, earthquake, tsunami, famine, drought or disease. But we can probably expect more of those too. Back on our home planet, things are probably a lot different. Perhaps the food isn't so nutritious. Perhaps we have much lower sperm count. Perhaps there are effective predators to keep our numbers down. And even with all our ingenuity, we can't overcome them. Perhaps there are natural phenomena that call our numbers, or at least prevent us from reproducing in any significant numbers. Allied to our rapid growth on Earth is our much extended longevity and significantly increased survival rate. When we first arrived, old age was considered to be in your 30s and most people never reached that. That might be well have been the case on our home planet too. But now that we have abundant food, no predators we can't deal with and few disease we can't control, we're in serious troubles. In many countries it has long been the tradition to have very large families under the assumption that most wouldn't survive the adulthood. But these days with vaccines and so on most of the children do survive, yet the tradition of having large families continues. We obviously can't tell whether or not our home planet was overpopulated 
But chances are, if we were there for long enough, nature would have found at least one way of dealing with us. Which it has so far failed to do on Earth. Probably because we arrived here so recently in evolutionary terms. Number 12. Lack of defensive capabilities. If we had really evolved in East Africa, as it's commonly supposed, predators, the big cats, would have been a huge problem for us. Go to a zoo and torment a lion. You'll soon find out how keen it is to kill you and eat you and how little chance of escape you would realistically have if it weren't behind a steel fence. The thing is, we aren't the slightest bit of equipped to deal with these dangerous beasts. We can't outrun them. We can climb trees, but so can most of them. They can swim just as fast as we can. Most of them are much, much stronger than us. They have teeth and claws that are shaped for attack, whereas we have no claws at all and our teeth are shaped for eating an omnivorous diet, not for attacking or defending ourselves. And they hunt in well-coordinated packs. Our unprotected feet are unsuited to walking over rocks. We have very poor night vision compared with other animals. We have very poor day vision compared with birds like eagles. We can't see outside the visible light spectrum, yet most insects can. And it would be a definite advantage to us if we could do too. We have a poor sense of smell compared with dogs or pigs. Yes, we can overcome most of these things using our superior brain power by building weapons, machinery, gadgets and so on. But Mother Nature can't possibly have predicted that we would develop these things. It's not that we ever had them and lost them as the need disappeared. We never had them in the first place. How can we have survived in East Africa when it is rife with dangerous animals? Perhaps the truth is we didn't evolve there at all. I believe it is far more likely that the aliens placed us in a location all over the world which approximately matched the conditions we were used on our home planet. Only once we had developed effective weapons did we venture into places like East Africa. With the knowledge that we could defend ourselves. This is the exact opposite of what most scientists tell us happened. But to me and many others it feels much closer to the truth and it fits evidence more closely. If we had really evolved in Africa, or been dropped there by the aliens, I think the big cats might have wiped us out pretty quickly. Remember, there were a lot more big cats back then than there are now, mainly because we turned the tables on them and we are wiping them out. And of course there were several billions fewer of us back then, perhaps only a few hundred or a few thousand initially, or only two if you believe we started with Adam and Eve. Taking all of these things into account, our lack of defensive capabilities and brute strength and all the other things listed above also proves one more thing. We did not and cannot have evolved from apes or from the same evolutionary branch that they are evolved from. And there are no other creatures on earth that we could have evolved from. Number 13. Destroying the environment. We are the only species on earth that changes and destroys its environment by doing what we do naturally. Not only that, but we are the only species that recognizes and understands that we are destroying the environment, yet we still continue to do so. Other species adapt themselves to suit their environment. We adapt the environment to suit us. Note. Some people claim that the beaver destroys its environment by felling trees, building dams and causing floods. I would argue that the beaver only alters its environment, it doesn't necessarily destroy it, and certainly not on the scale that we do. Even if we accept that the beaver does change or destroy its environment, that still only makes two of us out of all the millions of species on earth. And who's to say that beavers weren't brought here from another world too? Some people also claim that animals such as elephants damage their environment by felling trees. But in fact the trees need thinning out and old and damaged trees need felling away. So they're actually doing more good than harm. Where elephants cause most harm as far as humans are concerned is when they tear down fences around farmland. 
This is where humans have encroached on their territory. We get upset when they do this, but we have no right to be. We certainly can't blame them for damaging our environment. There are occasional outbreaks or swarms of creatures which do damage the environment. Things like locusts or crown of foreign starfish, for example. But this is always due to the overpopulation and overabundance of food. And modern nature has an effective plan for dealing with these outbreaks. They are soon dealt with, the environment recovers and everything returns to normal. But mother nature has not yet found any way of dealing with us. Other people say that cattle are damaging the environment, mainly by producing greenhouse gases. But hang on a minute. Why are there so many cattle? That's down to us humans. Without us, there wouldn't be nearly as many of them. The cattle can't be blamed for damaging the environment. And they certainly aren't aware that they're doing so. We are to blame for this. The same thing can be said for domestic cats and the number of wild birds they kill. It's true that they're doing damage to the environment, but they're only doing what they do naturally. They have no awareness that they're doing any harm. We may have domesticated them, but we haven't managed to get rid of their hunting instincts. And anyway, they wouldn't really be cats without that. Once again, there wouldn't be anything like as many cats as there are now if it weren't for us humans and our insistence that almost every home should have one. It's only because of the sheer number of them any real damage is caused. So once again, it's our own fault. And of course, the same thing can be said for many other plants and animal species that mankind has spread out of its natural environment. Japanese knotweed, harlequin, ladybugs, cane toads and many more. We may have had good intentions at the time, we had pests we need to get rid of and these things seemed like a natural and harmless way of dealing with them. Little did we suspect that once they are outside their natural environment, they would spread like wildfire and damage the environment themselves. If we left them where they belonged, they wouldn't have caused any problems. So guess what? It's our own fault. As an article in the National Geographic magazine from March 2005 started, when plant and animal species wind up where they don't belong, they can attack ecosystems and economies with terrible consequences. But how do those plants and animal species get where they don't belong? More often than not, it's down to us humans putting them there. But this statement applies equally to us. How did we get here? Because we clearly don't belong here and we definitely are causing terrible consequences. Number 14. Technological Leaps The evolutionary jump from Cro-Magnon, Homo sapiens, to modern Homo sapiens sapiens is ridiculously short in evolutionary terms. It took us thousands of years to just learn how to use rocks as tools and shape them to suit our needs. We were clearly up the creek without a pedal and going nowhere fast. And then, within only the last 7000 years, we suddenly created everything in the modern world. Farming, machines, electricity, water and sewerage systems, language, art, architecture, medicine, complex chemistry, nuclear power, quantum physics, and all the rest of it. Many people believe that the rate of scientific and technological progress has been way too far to be natural. And it just couldn't have been possible without outside help. While this might not prove that we were brought here from somewhere else, it does provide significant evidence that there is somewhere else out there that we might have come from. And it looks as if the aliens who brought us here might be coming back from time to time to see how we're getting on, and maybe to give us a bit of a nudge in the right directions. Either that, or the key to our rapid progress is encoded in our genetic memories. No other species on Earth experiences chronic illness on such a scale as we do. Take your own family or your work colleagues, for example. At least 75-80% to 80 of them will be suffering from something or other, though they might not tell anyone and you probably won't be able to tell just by looking at them. There are hundreds of chronic hidden or mostly hidden ailments disabilities or afflictions that affect us. Here are just a few that you might have heard of. Addison's disease, allergies, ankylosing, 
spondylitis, anorexia, arthritis, Asperger syndrome, and other forms of mild and less mild autism, asthma, binge eating, bipolar disorders, depression, and other mental illnesses like bulimia, bursitis, celiac disease, chronic fatigue syndrome and ME, chronic lung infections, chronic pain, cystic fibrosis, diabetes, epilepsy, eczema, fibromyalgia, heart disease, circulatory problems and hypertensions, hepatitis, HIV, insomnia, irritable bowel syndrome, colitis and Crohn's disease, lupus, migraines, multiple sclerosis, muscle weakness, nervous disorders, scoliosis, slow-growing tumors, stress, etc., etc. I'm barely scratching the surface here. There are hundreds more than you probably never heard of, nor have I. The thing is, the majority of these conditions only affect humans, or are extremely rare in other species. Why? Well, exactly. The Earth is not a happy place for our species. In fact, it's beginning to look as if it's barely habitable at all. Sure, the atmosphere is close enough to what we're used to and the gravity is not that far off and all the rest of it. But what the heck are these season things? What's this weird pollen stuff that we're not used to and why does it make us feel so bad? What about the disease the animals carry that we've been only been exposed to for the last few generations and have little or no immunity to? Some of the plants and animals seem nutritious enough at face value, but what about these other toxins they contain that we can handle? And why is there so much sugar here? And in so many different forms? There are more than enough differences between the Earth and our home planets to make us chronically ill. And sadly, the majority of us are. Although, as I said above, you can't usually tell just by looking. Try asking people, I guarantee you that you'll be shocked when you compare the total number of completely healthy people against the total number of those who suffer from any kind of affliction, which will be just about everybody. Pop your head outside for a moment, or look out of the window, and look at the facial expressions of the next 10 people who go past. Choose people you don't know or recognize. What do you see? I just tried this myself and four looked completely blank and expressionless. Four were gloomy with downturned mouths and looked like they were having a really bad life. One looked as if he was about to burst into tears and one had a haunted look. Shiny happy people they were not. 10 out of 10 looked and probably were unhappy or depressed. This is pretty much the same situation that you find all over the world. There are a few exceptions, of course, but from the look of things, I would say over 90% of all people are generally unhappy, with a large subset of them being seriously unhappy or clinically depressed. Many people say that this is a result of modern living, something we brought upon ourselves. We spend hours commuting to jobs we hate, we don't get enough sleep, we eat junk food, and even though we hate our jobs, we get upset if we lose them. And of course, everywhere we look, we see seas of blank or gloomy expressions, which is hardly going to help cheer us up. But hasn't it always been this way, ever since we first arrived on this planet? Was there ever a time when the majority of us were truly happy? History shows no evidence of that, from what I can tell. The wealthy upper classes have always enjoyed themselves, yes, but what about the ordinary people? Nope, not so much. Other species which are native to this planet don't suffer from any of these problems. Dogs are pretty much happy always, unless they're ill or lonely. Dolphins are always happy. As happy as a pig in a muck is a popular expression in Britain. You can watch seals sliding down an ice slope again and again, definitely happy. Elephants slide down mud slopes too, definitely happy. Bird flocks around in the sky, weaving in and out and calling to each other, happy as Larry. Even our children are mostly happy, until they reach adulthood and the truth dawns on them, or life hits them. 
Nobody ever tells them, of course, but somehow every single one of them works it out for themselves. And then their expressions turn black or gloomy, their shoulders hunch and they sadly trudge through the rest of their lives. Why the heck are we all so unhappy? Probably because we don't fit in as well as the aliens who brought us here thought we would. This isn't our proper environment. We feel completely out of place and we have done since the moment we arrived. We never been able to settle in and call this place home. It's enough to turn you to drink. Humans are the only species on earth, and possibly in the entire universe, that is bent on destroying itself. There are constant wars, of course, but there are probably wars on other planets too. But we smoke cigarettes, even though it clearly says on the package that doing so will kill us. We drink far too much alcohol, even though we all know what the limits are and what it will do to us if we continue. We eat junk food to the point of becoming morbidly obese, and then we keep on eating. As I said, no other species on earth does this. And it's almost certainly linked to the discussion above about unhappiness and depression. We don't look after our bodies because we don't care enough about life, neither our own nor anyone else. Our existence on this planet holds little meaning to us. Here are 10 pointers to human self-destruction. Gossiping, gambling, stress, body modifications, bullying, clinging to bad habits like smoking, drinking, eating to excess, cheating, stealing, craving for violence, lying. Where is this all leading? Probably not to our extinction, researchers think, but they unanimously agreed that we will never reach our true potential because we'll damned well make sure of it. We clearly have no business being here. The other form of self-destruction is mutually assured self-destruction, also known as global thermonuclear war. That's significantly less likely than it was back in the darkest days of the Cold War, but you can never be 100% certain that it will never happen. That's one more thing for us to feel gloomy about. So where did we come from? One thing we know for certain is that our home planet must be outside of our current solar system. It is almost certainly within our Milky Way galaxy, however and almost certainly in our local section of it. Let's consider the physical and environmental conditions we might expect to find on our home planet, based on the factors we discussed above. First, permanent cloud cover. It may be that the sunlight is much stronger there, but diffused by permanent or semi-permanent cloud cover. This means that despite the lack of direct sunlight, plants are still able to grow and we are still able to synthesize vitamin D. We don't get skin cancer or cataracts on our eyes. And our eyes don't get dazzled by the sun, because we hardly ever, never see it. The plants on Earth must be of a similar type to those on our own home planet, since we find them perfectly nutritious. Perhaps too nutritious, now that we've tempered with them to make them even more tasty and better. So the light levels and quality are probably similar, but without the glare. The downside, of course, is that astronomy will be pretty much impossible. The people living there might never have seen their own sun, let alone any of the other stars and planets. They might have no idea that these things even exist. Astrology probably won't exist either, but they will probably have developed other forms of fortune telling or divination just as we have. 2. Lack of destructive phenomena. As I mentioned above, we have no way of predicting earthquakes, tsunamis or hurricanes the way the Earth's native creatures do. The most likely reason for this is that they don't occur on our home planet, so we never evolved to a mechanism to forecast them. The lack of hurricanes is probably connected with the lack of seasons. The lack of earthquakes and tsunamis might be due to our planet having a solid core and no tectonic plates movement. Or it might simply have a very thick crust, which would be my own opinion. 
I would hypothesize that it also has a large solid inner core, composed mainly of iron surrounded by a molten liquid metal outer core. The relative movement of these as the planet rotates would generate the planet's magnetic field, which, as I'll discuss below, is probably significantly stronger than Earth's. Third, we probably orbit a binary star. Interestingly, our genetic makeup has a way of controlling the color of our skin using melanin. In parts of the Earth with a lot of sunlight, our skin turns almost black within a few generations. In more temperate regions, it turns almost white. That inbuilt genetic ability to change color must have been present in our home planet too, and it must be there for a reason. In my opinion, it indicates that the light levels on our home planet might be not so constant. The levels might raise gradually, perhaps over the period of a few generations, before reaching a peak, and then after a period of stability, gradually fall again. The color of our skins will adapt in accordance with this, protecting us from overexposure while ensuring we continue to receive enough sunlight to synthesize vitamin D and stave off low light disorders such as SAD. There could be any number of reasons for this. Perhaps the amount of light our star gives off fluctuates over a period of several generations. Perhaps our planet has an elliptical orbit that takes it closer or further away from our star. This latter instance would seem to indicate an orbit lasting hundreds of years, which would put us at the same considerable distance from our star. That star would therefore need to be considerably brighter or more massive than the Sun. However, the most likely scenario is that our planet orbits a binary star, which light levels rising and falling over a period of several generations, as consequence. There are two binary star systems within 17 light years of Earth. See the list of the most likely home star candidates in the next section. So the planets around these would be well worth investigating further. At the time of writing, no planets had been detected around either of these systems. I recommend we keep looking. On Earth, we can get freezing cold at night, even in the hottest countries and deserts. Without clothes, we would die of exposure or hypothermia. It obviously doesn't get as cold at night on our home planet. Again, a reasonable explanation for this might be that we orbit a binary star system, where a secondary sun heats and lights the planet after the primary sun has set. My initial thought was that such a planet would be probably inhospitable to life. The ever-changing gravity from the two stars would pull it in all directions, causing massive shifts in tectonic plates. That would lead to earthquakes, volcanic activity and flowing lava, not to mention acid rain, should there be any water present. However, when I discussed this with an astrophysics, his opinion was that the gravitational pull from the stars would be far too weak to have anything like this kind of impact on this planet. Plus, as we discussed above, our planet probably has a thicker crust than the Earth and might not have any tectonical plates at all. There is therefore no reason at all why it couldn't have two suns and still be perfectly hospitable. There is therefore no reason at all why it couldn't have two suns and still be perfectly habitable. We would orbit one of the binary stars and the secondary stars would orbit the primary one. Or they would orbit each other if they were of similar size. It could well be the case that our planet was almost never in darkness, though this would depend on the speed of the two stars orbit around each other, how closely that synchronized with our planet's speed of rotation. Sticking with the binary stars, if the stars were fairly close together, then our planet could orbit outside of them. There might well be a Goldilocks zone, where conditions are perfect for life, just as there is around a single star. But in this case, the two stars would appear to rise and set at roughly the same time, so there would still be hot days and cold nights. I'm not sure how we would keep warm at night on such a planet without clothes or fur. Perhaps we borrow on the ground and huddle together for warmth. 4. Gravity Differences is gravity on our home planet higher or lower than it is on Earth? There are arguments for both cases, but we do know that it must be different from Earth's. 
Not hugely different, of course, perhaps less than 5%. That's still perfectly habitable, but it's enough of a difference to have a marked effect on our bodies over the course of multiple generations. Arguments for the Earth's gravity being higher. It makes us tired and lethargic. We feel the weight of the world pressing down on us. However, that might be due to a heavier atmosphere on Earth, consisting of denser gases and nothing to do with gravity. Arguments for the Earth's gravity being lower. This is the opinion I favor. Humans are growing taller and taller year by year, faster than our skeletons and musculature can adapt, and it's giving us all bad backs. We would have been a much shorter people on our home planet. Either way, we are poorly adapted to Earth's gravity. We haven't been here long enough yet for our bodies to adapt. Other animals which have been on Earth for millions of years have adapted to living here and they don't have anything like the number of problems we do. 5. A lack of seasons Clearly we evolved to expect a more regular level of light throughout the year. The Earth seasons are caused by the planet being tilted over the 23.5 degrees. It's highly likely that our home planet has little or no tilt and therefore little or no seasonal variations. This is a huge repercussion of course, though all of this is consistent with what we already discussed. We wouldn't have colonized so much of our home planet, only the temperate and tropical bands. There would be large areas of the planet where it never rains and large areas where it almost never stops raining. This would render much of the planet infertile. In the case of the wet areas, the constant rainfall would wash away the topsoil and leach nutrients deep into the ground where roots couldn't reach them. Areas available for farming and thus habitation would be significantly reduced. We would probably have less nutritious crops. Most of the staple crops on Earth require cold winters. This would lead to low population density as it would take huge areas of the land to support a small number of people and their livestock. We would probably live in small, scattered settlements. There would be no big cities. No growing and no harvesting seasons. Plants might grow and ripen as when they were ready, not in sync with the planet, the weather or other plants, even of the same species. This would also make it extremely difficult for them to fertilize each other, of course. On the other hand, they might have evolved a way around this and found a way to synchronize their growth cycles by some other means, such as by emitting some sort of gas or pheromones. Problems with disease for ourselves and our planets and livestock. Many pathogens on Earth are wiped out during the winter. If there was no winter, we would be stuck with these things all year around, leading to high mortality rates, poor crop yields and so on. We would probably be less well developed technologically than we are on Earth. Many of the developments made during Earth's industrial revolution, for example, were about finding new and better ways of keeping us warm in the winter. If there weren't any winters, there would have been no need for this. On the other hand, after all this we might be just as well developed as we are now, but in a completely different way as we see it on Earth, probably one based more on farming. For example, we might have found ways to massively boost crop yields, irrigate or build roofs over arid zones, create artificial seasons, create flooding farms that are moved to higher and lower latitudes over the course of the year to create illusions of seasons. We might store seeds in the dark until we were ready to saw them. We could then create our own planting, growing and harvesting seasons, making farming much more efficient. So, on balance, our home planet would be familiar and yet quite different from Earth. It would probably have less nutritious crops, poorer yields, more disease, a higher mortality rate and much lower human population. Six. Longer days. Our body's natural circadian rhythm does not match Earth's 24 hour clock. This is easily checked by depriving someone of an external stimuli and letting them wake and sleep whenever they like. After about two weeks, they settle into a natural pattern completely out of step with the outside world, where days last for 25 hours. 
This leads to the natural conclusion that days on our home planet also last 25 hours. Here on Earth we have trouble adjusting to this and many of us have enormous trouble getting to sleep or suffer from sleep deprivation, which leads us to feeling exhausted and depressed for much of the time. When combined with all of the other effects from our failure to adapt to life on Earth, this can make life here feel pretty intolerable at times. There are three options we need to consider here. The first one, our home planet is larger than the Earth but spins at the same rate. The second one, it's roughly the same size but spins a little more slowly. The third one, it's larger and spins more slowly. We can be pretty certain from the discussion on gravity above that our home planet is not the same size as the Earth. In my opinion, the option with the greatest likelihood is that our home planet is slightly larger than the Earth and its speed of rotation is broadly the same, give or take a few percentage points. However, this does not mean that the gravity on our home planet must also be higher, since this would depend on the size and density of its core. However, I am inclined to plump for gravity being about 5% higher on our home planet. This would fit with the core being larger than the Earth's, as well as the stronger magnetic field that we discussed earlier. 7. Familiar Environment Our home planet will have edible plants that we love the taste of, even if they aren't particularly nutritious or readily available, or at least they weren't when we left. Perhaps some edible animals, unless the people there are now all vegetarians or cannibals. Drinkable water and breathable atmosphere, almost identical in composition to that of the Earth, although, as I mentioned above, there is a definite possibility that our home planet's atmosphere might be slightly less dense than Earth's. Presumably the aliens didn't take everyone from our home planet, just enough of us to get a new civilization started on Earth. The civilization on our home planet will probably have moved on considerably since then and might even be similar to that on Earth now. However, the people on that planet would have had to rely much more on their ingenuity to counter the lack of seasons, scarcity of food and lack of nutritional value in the plants. At the time that we were transported to Earth, we can be reasonably certain that civilization on our home planet was already reasonably well advanced. When we arrived here, we developed an advanced civilization much faster than should have been possible, particularly when compared with what our alleged ancestors had achieved during the thousands and thousands of years that they had been here. Within a very short space of time, we developed advanced tools, language, art, architecture, irrigation, drainage, sewage systems, and much more. Where did this come from, and how did we develop it all so quickly? There is the distinct possibility that it was encoded in a genetic memory. 9. A strong magnetic field As I discussed earlier, many animals, and especially birds, find their way around using the Earth's magnetic field. We cannot do this, but we do have the necessary cells in our brains to sense magnetism. This implies that our home planet's magnetic field is much, much stronger than Earth's. This would give us an extra sense that would be particularly valuable there as we wouldn't be able to see our suns or any stars due to the dense cloud cover, so we wouldn't be able to use them for navigation. The most likely star that our home planet orbits. We need to make a few assumptions before we can begin making our list. Let's say that the aliens which transported us here can travel at near light speed, but don't have the benefit of taking shortcuts through hyperspace or wormholes. Unless they have had developed the ability to put our bodies into some kind of suspended animation, we will continue to age during the journey. This is an important factor because we must still be capable of bearing children by the time we reach Earth. Let's say we need to be no more than 30 years old by the time we arrive. Even if the aliens select babies or very young children to make the journey, our home planet must therefore be no more than 40 light years from Earth and more realistically, no more than 30. It's highly likely that the aliens brought frozen embryos from our home planet and defrosted and nurtured them once they reached Earth. 
They might have brought adult humans along to help with this, though these adults might have been quite elderly by the time they arrived. Since the adult humans may have been too old to be implanted with the embryos, they were most likely implanted into Neanderthal-like hominids on Earth. Once they were born and had developed enough, they would probably have been separate from their surrogate parents and brought together as a separate group of humans, perhaps overseen and guided by the surviving human elders who made the journey with them. Having made the reasonable assumption that our home planet is no more than 30 to 40 light years from Earth, Here's a list of the most likely stars within that range that could have human supporting planets orbiting them. The number of light years from Earth is given in brackets after the name of each star. A light year is about 6 trillion miles, or just under 10 trillion kilometers, though we're more interested in the time it would take to get there than we are in the distance. Alpha Centauri, Alpha Centauri B, Epsilon Iridiani, 61 Cygini A, 61 Cygini B, Epsilon Indi A, Tau Ceti. Alpha Centauri A and B and 61 Cygini A and B are binary star systems. You may recall from our discussion earlier that there are strong indications that our home planet orbits a binary star system. There are many others within the 30 or 40 light year range but the majority of these are brown dwarfs and unlikely to have planets capable of supporting human life. Although life of some kind might still be found there or may have existed there at some point in history. It is highly likely that the aliens who brought us to Earth also came from a planet orbiting one of those seven stars. Bear in mind that the amount of time it takes to reach Earth from these stars will be greater if the aliens can travel at near light speed. If they can only travel at half the light speed, then it would take them 44 years to get from Tau Ceti, for example. If they can only travel at one tenth of the light speed, then only Alpha Centauri A and B would be realistically within range, and the aliens would have to come from a planet orbiting one of those stars. Are we the aliens? Yes, it's possible that we are. By which I mean that the aliens who brought us here are the same species, human, as us. They may have established some of the early settlements that can be found on Earth in places where modern humans are not known to have reached until thousands of years later. It may well be these alien settlements that we are now discovering in places where traditional science says they shouldn't exist. There is evidence that many of these settlements were abandoned abruptly, so the aliens, or descendants of the original aliens, might have decided to return to their own planet en masse. Why they might have done this is currently unknown, although it might one day be possible to make a reasonable deduction once the artifacts they left behind have been properly analyzed. Of course, if the aliens are humans too, then their home planet is also our home planet. When did we get here? This is an interesting question that does not have a simple answer. One common theory is that we are brought here at around the time that modern humans were first thought to have evolved in East Africa. There is no evidence of humans in Africa before this period, and no species that are sufficiently close genetically that we might reasonably have evolved from them. So this seems to fit. So we might surmise that a few hundred of us were transported from our home planet and dropped somewhere in East Africa about 200,000 years ago. Then we first started migrating from East Africa around 60,000 years ago. We'll ignore the earlier discussion about African big cat predators for now. While this fits with the current theory of modern human civilization, things aren't quite that simple. As I mentioned above, there are examples of prior civilizations more than 60,000 years old all over the world, many of them only just being discovered as they are now under the sea. So it might well be the case that aliens tried bringing humans here before, perhaps more than once, and the experiment failed. For some reasons, the first set or several sets of early humans initially thrived on Earth long enough to establish multiple civilizations around the world but then died out. Big cat predators, driven out by Neanderthals, who knows? 
So it seems that the aliens decided to try again much later. Perhaps tens of thousands of years later. Did they do anything different this time around? At the moment we don't know. But again, we might learn more when the ancient artifacts that are now being discovered are properly analyzed. One thing is certain. Well-developed human civilization existed on Earth long before we are supposed to have migrated to those places. Artifacts which have been discovered show that whatever civilization were around at the time were capable of complex thinking, had extensive knowledge of the stars and planets, had well-developed drainage and sewerage systems, and so on, and were capable of intricate workmanship using tools that hadn't been invented yet and materials that hadn't been discovered yet. And then they just vanished. There are gaps of many centuries or even thousands of years before those technologies appear again. Even in comparatively modern times, things like this have continued. A good example of this is the Antikyra mechanism, discovered in 1902 amongst objects recovered from a shipwreck of one of the Greek islands. The mechanism is an analog computer designed to calculate astronomical positions. It dates from the 1st century BC, but incorporates technologies that were not developed until the 13th century AD. We know that the humans didn't die out after this machine was made. But how did it come to exist over 1400 years before we had the technology to make it? Why are there no other examples? Why did the technology needed to make such a thing not develop and advance during the period of 1400 years? And how much more advanced would we be if it had? Did the aliens come back, checking on our progress and accidentally leaving it behind? Did an alien drown on that stricken ship? The most obvious answer to both of these questions is yes. Although the mechanism is far too complex to have been developed by humans living on Earth at that time, it also seems far too simple to have been developed by an alien who were capable of space travel. Perhaps it was simply a toy or a gift, perhaps a valuable antique from the aliens to one of the human kings of that period. Whatever it was, it has caused a heck of a stir in the scientific community since it was discovered over a hundred years ago. And that stir continues unabated to this day. The other main theory, which we looked at earlier, is that we were brought here much more recently, perhaps 40,000 or 50,000 years ago. And while some of us might have been dropped off in East Africa, a lot more of us were dropped off at numerous locations around the world. That would mean that the theoretical migration from East Africa to colonize the rest of the world never actually happened. We were already there. As I suggested earlier, East Africa might actually have been one of the last places on Earth to be colonized, since we first needed to develop weapons to protect ourselves against the big cats which roamed in the savannas. Conclusions 1. Life is common in a region of the galaxy. We know it exists on at least two or possibly three planets. Earth, our home planet, and whichever planet the aliens who brought us here came from, if they don't come from the same planet as us. Chances are extremely high that life exists on many more planets too, and in very similar form. 2. At least two out of the three inhabited planets we think exist share this form, Earth and our home planet. We don't know whether the aliens are carbon-based, but it's highly likely that they are, especially if they inserted their own DNA into us. 3. DNA is common and virtually identical throughout our region of the galaxy and possibly the entire universe. Again, at least two of the three inhabited planets we think exist share it, and all the flora and fauna on those planets have it. The flora and fauna on each of those planets might look somewhat different, but they all have practically the same DNA. It is highly unlikely that DNA evolved to be identical spontaneously in all these different places. We can draw two conclusions from this. Either all life requires DNA and DNA can only be the way it is, or DNA evolved in one place and was spread to all the other places by some external means – aliens, comets, meteors, etc. 
Other hypothesis. Scott Adams, the American cartoonist and blogger who created Dilbert, believes there's a greater than 50% chance that we're all just bits of a programming code running inside of a computer simulation of Earth. As anyone who knows anything about computer programming will tell you, the clues are all there. Take all those coincidences and feelings of deja vu, for example. They're just loops of programming code repeating themselves, a clear sign of lazy programming. And as my friend Dave Haslett is always saying, there are far too many coincidences for it to be a coincidence. Yet another theory, though much less common, suggests that our bodies are from Earth, but our species, our souls, are aliens. The Bible says we were placed here by God 4000 years ago, on the sixth day of creation. Note: Some people have combined these last two theories into one suggesting that the first humans to be given souls were Adam and Eve, and the earlier humans didn't have them. The Bible also suggests that Adam and Eve were not the first humans on earth, because when they were banished from the Garden of Eden it says they came across the wanderers, who they were afraid of. Some scholars believe that these wanderers are the earlier soulless humans. Others suggested that the wanderers are actually Adam and Eve's descendants, their children and grandchildren, though this seems rather implausible to me. There are plenty of other theories. Panspermia is the theory that life exists throughout the universe and is distributed to the other worlds by comets and meteors and so on. The specific part of panspermia that interests us is exogenesis. This theory that life originates elsewhere in the universe and was spread to Earth. Then there is the alien hybrid hypothesis. Not only do humans have 223 genes that appear in no other species on Earth, but some researchers say there's evidence of 20 different extraterrestrial civilizations in our DNA. And there's another interesting hypothesis that says the Greys were here first, the Greys being the archetypal aliens we're all familiar with, with the huge heads, large almond-shaped black eyes and grey bodies. Earth as a prison planet. Many people believe the Earth is actually our prison and that we were brought here as a punishment. According to their theory, we are a violent, murderous, thieving, lustful, vengeful group of criminals, a menace to society, who were rounded up and transported to a prison planet chosen for its habitable but primitive state, lack of tools and remoteness from civilization, i.e. the Earth. Our memories were erased and we were left to our own devices. We were monitored to see how we develop and whether the violent gene or genes disappeared. If it did, then we would be allowed to integrate back into galactic society. But by all accounts, it has not. So we're still here in our prison and we continue to lie, cheat, steal, murder, rape, pollute, destroy and so on. The pre-existing Neanderthal who had evolved some 200,000 years before we arrived, were quickly driven to extinction, over the space of a few thousand years. This appears to have been unprecedented. It was probably hoped that we would remain primitive, like the Neanderthal, and would integrate with them and perhaps breed with them. But no. Our unexpected rapid development into an advanced society, with tools, language, mathematics, science, art, architecture, farming, domestication of animals and so on, was most likely the result of genetic memory, which had been completely overlooked when our brain memories were erased. Genetic memories are a set of common experiences that are encoded in our genome over a long period of time and are present at birth. Evaluation of the leading hypothesis Plausibility and evidence ratings are my own. First, we were brought here by aliens around 200,000 years ago, but we died out after establishing civilization around the world and the aliens tried again between 40,000 years and 50,000 years ago. Plausibility 7, evidence 7.5. 2. We were brought here by aliens between 40,000 and 50,000 years ago. Plausibility 7, Evidence 7 3. 
We evolved on Earth from the same evolutionary branches as the apes. Plausibility 10. Evidence 3.5. 4. We were brought here by aliens around 200,000 years ago and dropped off at several sites around the world. Plausibility 7. Evidence 6.5. 5. Aliens inserted or replaced genes or DNA sequences into Homo erectus to create us. Plausibility 6. Evidence 7. 6. Civilization more than 60,000 years old, which are outside East Africa, were established by aliens. Plausibility 6. Evidence 6. 7. The Earth is a prison planet. Plausibility 6. Evidence 6. 8. We were brought here by aliens around 200,000 years ago and dropped off only in East Africa. Plausibility 7. Evidence 4.5. 9. Life, but not necessarily mankind, was brought here by a comet or meteor. Plausibility 9.5. Evidence 2. 10. Life is common throughout the universe. Plausibility 8.5. Evidence 2. 11. We are in a computer simulation. Plausibility 5.5. Evidence 4.5. Number 12. Our bodies evolved on Earth, but our spirits are alien. Plausibility 2.5. Evidence 2. Number 13. God created us 4000 years ago on the sixth day of creation. Plausibility 1. Evidence 0. <laughs>